and over time it had fallen into disuse. It had fallen into disrepair because the people of Israel, well, they had gone chasing after other gods. But now, times had changed because all of a sudden with Josiah, they had a godly leader once again. But as incredible as it might seem, during those years when the temple was basically just ignored and was irrelevant, you know what the nations had done, the nation of Israel had done? They had lost, really lost, the scriptures. They went missing. You know, this is in days before printing presses. This is in days before copy machines, copies of the law were very few and very, very far between. All they had was just a few fragile scrolls that were kept, kept in the temple for use during public worship. And somehow or other, these scrolls got lost. Probably some faithful priest had hidden them to protect them. And then either he died and nobody knew where they were, or he just failed to tell anyone the result was the same. There was no scripture for the people to read from. But now along comes Josiah and he wants a restoration of the temple. And in the course of all of that work, guess what? Those lost scrolls were found. Can you imagine the joy and the delight in those folks when it was announced that the scrolls had been found and all of a sudden, the nation had God's word once more in the book of Deuteronomy. God's teaching for the community of faith. And it gave King Josiah the instructions that he needed, that he needed to make religious reform happen. The places of worship for the pagan gods, they were destroyed. They were destroyed. The priests, the priests for the Baal worshipers, they were murdered. And a new era had begun for the people of Israel. And all of this was seen by one youngster who was growing up not far from Jerusalem. Who was growing up. He had been born into a priestly family in a small town of Anathoth that was only two or three miles north up the road from Jerusalem. But Josiah, he was not around very long. He was killed in battle with the Egyptians in 609 BC. And he was succeeded, as was normal, by one of his sons, Jehoahaz. But the reign of Jehoahaz lasted only three months. And the Pharaoh from Egypt took him prisoner back to, Is uh, back to Egypt. And the Pharaoh installed another brother, another of Josiah's sons, Jehoiakim, in his place. And he sat on the throne as the leader of the, sadly now, a vassal state. Israel, again, was under the control of the Egyptians. And that's where we find Jeremiah's ministry beginning in earnest. But Jeremiah had been prepared for this ministry. He had been schooled and he had been educated in God's words after those scrolls were found. Interesting that this, it was all falling in place in a timeline. He knew what the Lord expected of the chosen people. He had been raised just close enough, two or three miles, to Jerusalem to know what it was all about, but he was far enough away from it that he wasn't totally awed by it. Yep, yep, Jeremiah was destined to be a prophet of God. There is no question about it, but he was not given that task without the proper preparation. He had been prepared. He had been educated in God's words after the scrolls were found. He knew what was expected. Well, if you want to know 
What God expects of you and me and us tomorrow, maybe all we need to do is take a look behind us at our yesterdays. Scholars tells us, tell us that Jeremiah's call was probably written about as much as 20 years after it actually happened. But, and you all know this, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, Jeremiah could share what he had come to understand. And what he understood was that God prepared him and that God prepares Jeremiah's. All of them, us folks, us, for whatever service he calls us to perform. I've probably given this illustration before because I love it. And it's an old one. Bear with me because it's very pertinent. There was a farmer one day, and he was out in his field, and the field was beautifully green, and the sky was magnificent blue. And he looked up into the sky, and there in puffy, lovely clouds were the letters P-C. And he looked at those letters, and he pondered those letters, and he was convinced that it was God telling him one thing and one thing only. P.C. meant preach Christ. So, the very next day, he left his farm. He took his scholarly material, his biblical material, and he began his career as an evangelist. It didn't last very long at all because the poor man was horribly unsuccessful. He just had no success, whatever. And after some time, he came back home, and he went to church to talk to his pastor. And the pastor was a sympathetic man who realized that the farmer just wasn't terribly suited for the task that he had set for himself. And the farmer said, but what about the vision? How do you explain that? And the pastor replied, you misread it, buddy. You misread it, my friend. In this case, the PC did not mean preach Christ. And the farmer said, well, then what did it mean? And the pastor very kindly looked at it and he said, plant and that's what the man was supposed to do. You know, God prepared Isaiah. God prepares us. And we can count on that. But adequate preparation is not the whole story. Jeremiah had been prepared. We know that. But we also know that he just didn't jump right in and say, let me at it. I want to do it. Ah, uh -uh. no. He held up his hand and he said these words. Ah, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. And God didn't fool around. He handled that. He handled that just straight up. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now, I have put the words where? in your mouth. Now you know, sometimes we talk with people and we get a little bit agitated. And one of the things that I've been not prone to say, and I suspect you have too, is don't you go putting words in my mouth. Any of y'all ever said that? Mm -hmm. We all have. But Jeremiah said, God put those words in his mouth. And Jeremiah could not, he could not object to that. And besides that, it was just an excuse. Now, scholars tell us that Jeremiah was probably in his late teens or early 20s, if anything. And at that point in life, we are convinced that we can do what? We can do anything. When I was 22, I could lick the world, and so could most of us. The only thing that I possibly couldn't do, I probably couldn't die. 
because I felt at age 22 I was immortal. But at any rate, it was just an excuse Jeremiah used, and God said, don't worry about it. Get over it. And that age excuse has been used for years, but usually that's swamped, usually to the other extreme. We hear, I'm too old, way more than we hear, I'm too young. Gosh, Pastor, I really think I'm too old to teach Sunday school. Get somebody younger. Gee, Chairman of the Board, I don't want that position of leadership. I'm too old. I've done it seven times. Let somebody else do it. Let the young ones do it. It's their turn. Well, when the word of God came to Jeremiah, the word was disaster. And Jeremiah was like everybody else. He loved his country. He loved his people. And he had no desire whatsoever to pass judgment on them and to announce destruction to them. I know of no preachers, no preachers that really want to do that. But when prophets, preachers, see things wrong that are around them, well, to be honest, they're just stuck. They're, they're, they're called. To, pay, to call attention to things that are wrong. And that's what happens sometimes when a preacher stands up for something that's not real popular, they get in trouble. And in light of that, any excuse would have been better than no excuse at all. So Jeremiah used his youth because he knew this was a scary business. Jeremiah knew it. But again, God was smart. And God was simple and straight to the point. He said, Jeremiah, don't worry about it. Listen to his words. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you, and I will rescue you. God had prepared him for the task. God had proposed that task to him. And now God was preserving, uh, preserving him, promising to preserve him as the task was being carried out. But you've got to take note of one thing. That promise wasn't there and said there would be no trouble. And if you know anything about Isaiah, I mean Jeremiah, there was a lot of trouble. But the promise was that the trouble would not win. And folks, Jeremiah saw his share of trouble. It wasn't a walk in the park being God's prophet. He was hated by his family and his friends. He was forbidden to preach, which he did so well there in the temple. He was arrested. He was put into stocks. He was threatened with death. He was in prison. And finally, he was exiled back to Egypt. And there he finally died, but God had given him 50 years, a half of a century, and it was one of the most difficult half centuries in all of the history of the nation of Israel. So God had let him do what God had prepared him to do, and he brought him through it. So, that was a long time ago. What does that have to do with us sitting right here this morning? And where do we fit into that story? Well, the question I ask you as we go from here, what is God calling you and me to do? What's he calling us to do? And again, if we want to know what God expects of us tomorrow, we need to look back at what we've done with yesterdays. As individuals and as a church, I pray, I hope that our eyes have been prepared to see what has gone on behind us. I hope that our ears have been opened 
to the stories that have come to us over the hundred years almost that this church has been here. For the next year, as we move forward to 